I have toured the world in many four-wheel drive vehicles, uh, my own and those loaned to me. I have had uh, I've 16 my, myself, and all 16 I have modified the suspension <clears throat> in different ways. And it's the first thing we go to when we when we get a new vehicle, we think, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna sort out the suspension because the manufacturer suspension is, we see it as, is inadequate for our needs. But here's the thing, <clears throat> there is a real difference between the real world and what you see and hear in an accessory store. Right, Range Rover, what did I do? <clears throat> it was 1984. Four, so I couldn't get springs. I couldn't because the payload was too low. It was sagging at the back. But I could change shock absorbers. The standard shock absorbers were terrible. I mean, really useless. Useless. So I put in a set of Bullsteins, and they uh, lasted until I sold the vehicle. Outstanding, because I needed control. I felt the vehicle was just wallowing, and with a load in the back, it was even worse. And that corrected the problem. Shock absorbers control the. They control it. They don't. They influence it in terms of handling, but they do not influence it in any way at all in terms of load carrying. They control the springs. They slow them down when they come up and they slow them down when they move back. And they prevent this. They control it. And good ones <clears throat> will control them well, even over very rough terrain, very, hard, very bad corrugations when potentially they get very, very hot as they're doing their job in controlling the suspension, which allows you to control the car. It's all about control. <clears throat> and then you have springs. Now, the normal reaction is, okay, I, um, I, want to, I want to accessorize my vehicle and I want to take it over land and I want to fill water, carry extra fuel, surfboards, fishing tackle, outboard motor, whatever. And you, you find you load the standard vehicle and the the vehicle starts to, starts to sag, and it doesn't look good. Here's two things. Looking good and performing good. These are not the same thing. <clears throat> it's actually okay, I believe, if it sags a bit at the back. It's not really a problem, as long as it doesn't sag too much. Now what happens is that if the vehicle sags a little bit, first thing is if you're driving over rough terrain and you feel good, it feels good, it has good control. You're not hitting the bump stops, the end of the spring. In other words, there's this big rubber thing, and as the spring compresses, it hits the, at its maximum travel, hits the bump stops, and boom, boom. You don't want that happening often. If it happens occasionally, it's okay. It's actually probably a measure of it being quite good. That's really hard. I like to call them yumps. Oh, boof. And you feel, okay, I can feel that whack in the back suspension. In the extreme ones, if it hits occasionally, you've probably got your springing pretty close to being right. If it never, ever, ever, ever hits, you're probably oversprung. So getting the spring rates good and the shock rates good is quite, can be quite tricky. So now you've added the springs and you now, the vehicle looks good because it's sitting up at the back and you load some stuff in the back and it's still looking up at the back. Well then, the get, my guess is, it's oversprung. And what overspringing does, is that it means that the suspension isn't in harmony. When I say suspension in harmony, I'm talking about the harmony between the shock absorbers and the springs. They both gotta do, a, gotta do work, okay? And you want the shocks to do the work. If the springs are so stiff, they prevent the shocks from doing their work, you are oversprung, and the ride inside is going to be terrible, really uncomfortable, and the shock, the stresses on the chassis, very much higher than they would normally be, and normally, and higher than the manufacturers designed them to be. And that's often what causes uh, chassis failures, chassis cracking. They take a vehicle, and <clears throat> they load it very heavily, often overloaded, and they say, oh, to make this right, to make it level, we've got to spring the hell out of it. So they put these great big <clears throat> double, you know, 22 pack leaf springs just to get it off the ground or double coil, the outer coil, inner coil airbags, just to get the thing to sit level. 
Well, what happens? The stresses on the chassis are so great, the chassis breaks. I've seen it. And every time I've seen it, I've said, oh, let me have a look at the springs. And these are massive springs because it's so heavy. So it's not just the weight that's doing it. It's oversprung and undershocked. So what they're doing is they're putting these massive springs in. They're not changing the shock absorbers. They're leaving the shock absorbers. Maybe they're putting a higher performance shock absorber like a, like a gas shock or something, you know, which will improve things. But now the shock isn't doing its job. The spring's doing all the work. And guess what? The chassis starts having to absorb the shock of the suspension. And when that happens, the chassis eventually cracks and breaks. So again, it's this harmony. For newcomers coming into four-wheel drive, they have often a misconception that, um, okay, my vehicle has a gross vehicle, that's the gross legal permitted vehicle mass of so many kilograms. Let's say it's 3,000 kilograms, okay? And they, say, and they go into the shop and the shop says, okay, this is a 400 kilogram constant, I'll tell, constant whatever, it's a three, in other words, they're gonna say to you, this is a 400 kilograms spring and they'll, flash this number at you. They might, the good ones, will say, well, what are you carrying? They will fit a spring to whatever you're carrying. No accessory cen center is gonna say to you, mate, you're overloaded. I I'm not gonna give you a 700 kilogram spring because honestly, anything over 600 with that vehicle, you, no. They're not gonna do that, very rare, very, very rare for them to do that. They're gonna say, well, what, what, what load are you carrying? Here's a spring. Oh, and use these shocks. All right, and in other words, it's not tailor-made. It's not, it's not an expert coming in, at, rarely, is it an expert coming in saying, that's, how, I know how heavy the vehicle is. I'm not guessing, I know, because I've got a weigh bridge. That's how heavy the vehicle is fully loaded. Okay, what are we gonna do? Is that accessory manufacturer gonna say to you, <clears throat> it's too heavy, mate. It's too heavy. I'm not selling you a spring. No, of course they're not. They'll do their best to sell you something to best sort out your issues. They're never gonna tell you, no, I'm not gonna. Only a, a, a consultant who understands four-wheel driving will actually say to you, mate, you, 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 you're, you're heading for a broken chassis. If you do that, you have to reduce the weight. And often people who will hear that news will say, you don't know what you're talking about, and go to somebody else who will give them better news and fit them what they hoped to have fitted. So if you're going back to, you, if you're a beginner in this, you go to a store and they say 400. You go, great. <clears throat> I had a GVM, Maxim GVM, recommended by the manufacturer of 300, I, of, of, of 3,000 uh, kilograms, and now you've given me 400 kilograms. Oh, I've increased it by 400 kilograms. Isn't that fantastic? No, you haven't. You have not increased the permissible GBM by 400 kilograms. It still remains the same. It does not change. It doesn't change. What the springs do is have that vehicle at maximum GVM perform better, which means you still stick to that GVM. You've now got, because remember, when a manufacturer creates a vehicle, they're creating a vehicle where Somewhere in the middle between max GVM, max loaded, it's going to be sitting down at the back and not performing particularly well. And when it's light, a little bit choppy and bouncy, but reasonably good somewhere in the middle. The manufacturers have got to choose a middle line somewhere. And we're saying as overlanders, we want that vehicle to perform better when heavy. So if we're going to perform better when heavy, we need to increase the spring load rate and improve the shock absorbers to control those springs because most of the time we're gonna be at the higher weight range of the GVM. That's why we do it. It's not to increase GVM and it doesn't safely increase GVM. It's a very, very important thing to learn and understand. <clears throat> and that's the safety margin. When building an overlander, you have these safety margins. The safety margin of load is the manufacturer's recommended GVM. If you stay within that and you have a well-tuned shock and spring combination, the chances of you breaking anything are very low. Now it's up to luck. 
or if you're a very aggressive driver, you can still break something. But the chances there, even there, are very, very low because the manufacturers know that <clears throat> not all vehicles, all the drivers of their vehicles will have a high sense of mechanical sympathy. Some will just have absolutely none at all and, and do absolutely nothing when they're driving off-road, but they just know right foot is foot flat or nothing. Very common, as we know. And those people tend to break things. <clears throat> Um, but people that are more sensitive to the vehicle won't break things. And those people that are more sensitive and more mechanically sympathetic to the vehicle are the ones that you actually want to get to build your vehicle for you and design your vehicle for you because they will not recommend, for example, a heavy load on the roof rack or an overloaded vehicle generally. To wrap up the suspension story, is the load, the C of G of the vehicle, the center of gravity. The center of gravity in two planes. You have the y-axis and the x-axis. Y-axis is affected by, obviously, load on the roof. The vehicle manufacturer will have a maximum roof load. <clears throat> Some are quite low, like Defenders, it's, as low, it's uh, 75 kilograms. On Land Cruiser, let's put uh, Nissan Patrol, uh, they're upwards of 200, they're much higher. And what this means, that this is two things. Firstly, the manufacturer said, under conditions that are, su that are likely to be, uh, th these vehicles will be used under, <clears throat> we say that you put that kind of load on the roof and the vehicle will, perform safely, still within its rollover safety capabilities, and nothing's going to break. <clears throat> the roof pillars are strong enough to carry the load, those three things. And those three things are, are combined. So now if you take a vehicle like Defender, for example, and you say, okay, well, I don't really care about what the manufacturer says, I'm going to put a roof rack on it and I'm gonna load it with 150 kilograms, which is very, very common, very, very common with because like defenders. What the owners have done is they've said, okay, I'm willing to <clears throat> now go beyond that safety margin. I'm now outside the safety net set by the manufacturers. Oh, what do the, what do the manufacturers know? Why, <clears throat> I mean, what do they bother spending all that money doing rollover testing for anyway? Not for me, I'm going to ignore it. <clears throat> so again, you're now going outside the safety parameter. As the weight goes up on a vehicle, it obviously affects the center of gravity and the vehicle will roll more. That means that the shock absorbers have to do much more work as, than they might otherwise might. So in rough terrain, the vehicle which normally would be doing this because the shock absorbers are controlling this vehicle that has the center of gravity fairly low, is now having to control a vehicle that is doing this because it's got all of this weight on the roof. So, together with modifying the vehicle and adding additional weight up top, like stupid things like water, water tanks on the roof, I mean really, anybody who recommends you put a water tank on your roof rack knows nothing about the science of overlanding and off-road driving. <clears throat> I'm sorry, they don't. I'm, or they do and they're ignoring it because they can sell you something. Don't put heavy stuff on the roof rack, especially water, especially water. For example, <clears throat> you've got a tank on the roof rack along the, the width of the roof rack. I've seen them. And it's like a 40 litre tank. You've got 40 kilograms. Not only have you got 40 kilograms on the roof, when the vehicle does this, you've got 40 kilograms. And let's say it's half full. You've got 20 kilograms, not just on the roof rack, but every time the vehicle does this, the water pushes it even further. The, the inertia of the water does this, which amplifies the vehicle doing this. It is a terrible idea. And yet I see it in the, in, the, in the accessory stores. So again, do that, you're going further out of the safety zone. And if you don't correct it properly with your suspension,
even further out of the zone. And for something like a high roof load, it's springing and shocks, more especially shock absorbers, because you want to you want something to, sl to slow that. You're not going to stop it. A shock absorber is not going to stop it. It's going to control it. It's going to slow it, which means it's not as violent. So the more weight you have on the roof, the heavier duty the shocks need to be. And every time you do a modification on the vehicle, you now need to chase it with suspension that is going to be suitable to make sure that you stay within the safety margin. That's my take on it anyway. Not everybody will agree with me. That's my almost 40 years of overlanding experience. And I've just shared what I feel about how, how suspensions can serve you so, so well, but at the same time, promise something that they cannot deliver. Thanks for watching. You want more? Like and subscribe. See you for the next one.